So this is what we're going to talk about today, building better developers. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty big philosophical question. But before we get into that one, let's do some of the more straightforward ones, just so we can get to know each other. Um, who am I? And why am I here? So if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's uh, at Rowan underscore M. Uh, if you want to find me on Google+, Plus, it's google.com plus Rowan Mealwood. Um, if you want to find me on IMDb, you can go there and find out exactly why I'm on IMDb. I'll leave that conversation for the bar later. Um, and why am I here, then? So I'm, this can be our little secret, I, I'm not a good developer. Um, but I feel like I've worked with a lot of people who were. And over the years, um, they've taught me a whole bunch of different things. So, so this talk is basically just a long, rambling series of my opinions about things. So little lessons that I've picked up, uh, little stories that I've heard, bits and pieces where I think we can make better developers. So this is what we've got. This is our sad, average developer. And, and he's sad for a number of reasons. Um, kind of looks a bit like Kristen Stewart from Twilight, <laughs> staring off into the distance. Um, he's got a couple other problems as well. Uh, <laughs> he's, Good abs, though, so he's got that going for him. So what we're going to do over the course of this talk is we're going to change this guy. We're going to take away the parts that I don't approve of. We're going to put some new ones in there, and we're going to build something better at the end of this. OK. Now, one of the things that I wanted to say, though, is often I come to conferences, and at the end of the conference, I kind of go back to my job actually feeling like less confident than when I came to the conference, because suddenly I'm here and I'm surrounded by all these people, and it's kind of like, oh, it is very clear that I am an idiot. And, I, <laughs> and you guys are way smarter than I am. Um, but I don't want you to be you know, beating yourself up about that, because frankly, there will always be people out there who are smarter and better than you in some aspect. So, so don't worry too much about you know, trying to hack off your own limbs to replace them with something better. You know, maybe, maybe there is some good stuff there that you can just leave, and that's okay. And the other thing I want to say as well is don't go crazy and think that you have to be this kind of superhero who's going to fix all of this stuff. Like, you're not going to go back to work on Monday and immediately kind of go, hey, guys, I've put in a CI server, uh, and now we're not rolling anything out unless it's got 100% test coverage. No one's, no one's going to thank you for that. No, <laughs> not immediately, OK? So don't try and change all of this stuff on your own. Because if you decide that you need to be the one superhero, the one martyr in the organization, then not only are you not going to do it, you're never going to be the best at everything. And you're going to burn out along the way. And when you burn out, and you know, you're in the middle of the office and you have that nervous breakdown, you just kind of tear your clothes off and walk out into the sunshine. You know, everybody else is going to be left there having to clean up your mess as well. So it's not just going to be you going down in flames. You're going to take other people with you. OK. Now, the other thing about this talk is we can get a little interactive. Not only am I just going to spout my opinions about development, I'm also going to give you uh, an insight into a whole bunch of books and films that I believe you should have seen. Um, so what we're going to do is Whenever you see something on here, if you recognize where it's from, then feel free just to shout it out, and, and we can see. And if you don't, then this is going to be doubly educational for you, because I'm going to give you a whole reading list and watching list that you need to go and take care of. OK. So up first, your editor. This is the tool that you spend almost all of your day with. So it needs to be a part of you. It needs to be like a reflex. Um, and tools are there to help you achieve the goals. So for me, I kind of have a, um, I have a love-hate relationship with Eclipse. Uh, I, I come back to it on a sort of semi-annual basis to see how uh, not sucking it is at doing PHP development. And, and every year, I manage to use it for about three or four days before I find myself falling back to other editors again. Um, but 
one of the things about the tools that we use as developers is that this is not usability in the sense of you know, grabbing, grabbing an iPhone app and just intuitively being able to use it. You're a professional, so your tools require investment from you into making that tool like a reflex that just becomes part of you. Okay, so this is our first body part that we're going to deal with. This is, a, this is a hand with six fingers on it. And yes, yeah, okay. So in The Princess Bride, which if you haven't read it or watch it, you need to go and do that now. Um, no, well, not right now, but you know, <laughs> give me an hour. Okay. Um, now, Count Rugen in that, he has six fingers on his hand. Now, the reason he has six fingers on his right hand uh, is because of the editor that he uses. He suffers from a condition known as Emacs hand. <laughs> <laughs> and because because the, there are certain things, you know, like if you want to write a file, you have to put your nose in a particular position and hold down 17 <laughs> keys at the same time. Um, so, before we get on to what my favorite editor is, um, I'm going to take you to a little story. So, has anyone read any Neil Stevenson? Wow. Okay, g guys, g start noting this down. You are going to need to... Uh, okay, so Neil Stevenson is a, um, he's like mostly a science fiction author, but he also does a bunch of other technical-related stuff. Um, did a really good essay. In the beginning, there was the command line. Um, but he also wrote this story about a job that he had over summer when he was uh, a lot younger. And he talks about this drill that he used on a construction site called the whole hog. And essentially, it was just this metal box that had a hole in one side where the drill bit would go. Uh, it had a slot on the other side where you could basically put like a, you know, an iron bar or something to hold it in place. And it had a button that made the drill go. And when you press that button, the drill would start, and it would not stop until you stopped pressing that button. It didn't matter what you put in front of it. It would just drill straight through it. He was saying there were, there were issues you know, where people hadn't secured themselves properly, so they would be drilling into something that was quite hard, and um, the drill wouldn't stop, so it would just kind of spin round and throw them into a wall or something. Um, so these are, these are serious tools. And after he got used to it, so this is just a little excerpt from it, this... This, for me, was the bit that started to feel a bit like some developers I've met when they start to have opinions. And maybe this is a bit hypocritical. Nah, nah, I'm, I'm not like this. Um, but it's just the looking at other drills and considering them merely scaled up toys to design to exploit the self-delusional tendencies of soft-handed homeowners. And it was kind of like, so that's, that's the, the area you were in when... Um, you know, ages ago when people on their websites would kind of proudly add the banner that says, made with notepad, kind of thing. <laughs> and, and now you kind of have that sort of slightly sneering looking down on that. you kind of like, you write code in notepad? Um, but this is the thing, is our tools are designed to do specific jobs, and they can be very dangerous black boxes if you do not put the effort in to learning how to use those tools correctly. So... With that in mind, I want to tell you about my favorite black box. Um, so Vim, Vim really comes into the um, or comes from the philosophy of old school Unix tools, where when something's going right, you get no output, um, and also you don't get any kind of information about how to use the tool or anything. So who's who, who uses Vim? Okay, good. So you guys know that. Well, before you've added your 500 lines of VimRC to make it look completely <laughs> different to every single other instance of Vim. Um, if you just load up Vim normally, you get nothing. You get a blank screen. But if you want to get into the using Vim, now the thing is, the reason is that's the most efficient thing to do. Okay? You don't need all that extra information because you should just be reflexively going through these keys, dropping into edit mode, doing stuff, you know, all of these kind of bits and pieces. But you do need to start somewhere. So if you want to get into Vim, um, Vim comes with its own little Vim tutor. So you can run this, and what this does is it loads up Vim for you with an existing text document. And just by reading the text document, it explains to you 
how to start navigating and how to use the various commands. So for example, you wouldn't use the arrow keys to move the text down. Uh, that would be ridiculous and inefficient. Um, so you, you actually use, uh, you use J and K to, uh, to navigate through the text because that means you don't have to move your fingers off of the home row on the keyboard. Okay, so that's a lot quicker than going all the way over to the arrow keys, which are miles over in that direction. <laughs> okay. but, but, you know, if you go through the tutorial and you learn this stuff, then those are, that's valuable time that you're saving. You're not fighting with your editor. Your editor becomes this kind of reflexive part of you that you are just able to really rapidly do this stuff. So there you go. You start going through it. It's explaining all of this. Now, if the command line does not get you as kind of ridiculously excited as it does me, then there are other ways to get into Vim as well. Um, this talk isn't entirely about Vim. I mean, we can do that if you want. Um, so if the command line's not entirely your thing, you can go here, vimadventures.com, okay? <laughs> Which is, I, I gave these guys my credit card details instantly and bought this. <laughs> so this is like a top-down RPG that takes you through how to use Vim. So you move your little guy around using, using the H, A, and K, and J keys, and you navigate through and you collect commands as you go around. So it's like you're going in here, so you start learning the commands that will let you jump past the rocks and open the chests and all this kind of stuff. And at the end of it, it's, it you're, you're learning Vim at the same time. Like they're sneaking it into your brain. Okay, so, so we've got our tool, and we, we're going to make sure that the tools we have within our professional arena are things that help us, that don't make us spend a lot of extra time. Um, so, for example, those times when I'm going through the Eclipse configuration, trying to work out why it's eating three gigs of RAM every single time. See, that's, that's not helpful as far as a tool goes. So this leads me on to another thing. It's deliberate practice. So there's a lot of stuff that you can pick up on the job, and you learn it as part of a project. But if you are investing in your professional development, then and you guys are at a conference, so I probably don't have to tell you that you should be investing in professional development. That's what you're doing right now. You're putting in your own time to do something specific to improve your skills. Yeah, OK. So in one of the Kill Bill films, there's your traditional uh, kung fu training montage where, um, where Uma Thurman is doing the bit where she has to punch a block of wood. Bless you, Derek. Um, she has to punch a block of wood from a very close distance. So she just spends, uh, I don't know, however long the song lasts, um, just kind of <laughs> continually in front of this block of wood, just punching it from a very short distance. So that eventually, later on in the film, uh, she's able to just punch her way clean through a plot hole and, uh, and escape this kind of tricky situation. But the point is, <laughs> the point is, sometimes you have to, to get these skills in place, you have to do these kind of simple, repetitive actions to put these things like reflexes into your brain, into your muscle memory, so that when it comes to doing this stuff on the job, again, like your tool, you're able to just jump straight in there and make it happen. So one of the ways that we can do this is, um, now I, I know that these days referring to someone as like a code ninja or a rock star. This, we're getting into cringeworthy territory. So, so this is the only martial arts reference I'm going to do, and then we'll, we'll move swiftly on. Um, now, in martial arts, you have this term called uh, a kata. And that's basically the thing where you see them practicing like a, um, you know, a series of like three punches or uh, a punch and a kick followed by a punch again. And you just repeat that same sequence of movements again and again until you're able to you know, do it in your sleep almost. Now, what we can do is we can, apply this, um, we can apply this technique to code as well. So these two guys, uh, Dave Thomas and Roy Oshiro, Dave Thomas came up with the idea of code catters. Um, so you can go to those links, and what he presents are a series of very simple exercises that you know, take anywhere from about five minutes to 30 minutes, and they're just solving very simple coding problems. And the idea is that you go home, and you spend that five minutes solving that coding problem. Then you just delete that code. And then the next day, you come back again, and you solve the same problem. Delete it, come back, solve the same problem. 
So that all of these things um, soon just become natural, just become memory. So that the next time you're kind of like, oh, okay, how do I need to, let's see, oh, that's a good example. I was trying to um, learn some Android programming. So it's like, I get a URL, I need to pull down the URL, which represents an image, and I need to read that into a bitmap. So that involves a couple of different libraries, but that's a pretty common thing. So it's kind of, I should not be having to look that up each time. I should get that into my brain so that I'm able to just go straight in and take care of that each time. Um, another thing that you can look at as well is uh, there's Project Euler out there, which again, just gives you like a series of very simple maths problems, um, and you write some code to solve that. And one of the other ways that you can approach this kind of thing is you can write the code to solve the problem, and then the next day, when you come back to solve that problem, deliberately make yourself choose a different approach. Like pick a different algorithm, pick a different solution, but try and solve the same problem again. Force yourself to not always go for the solution that's most comfortable and obvious to you, but push yourself to do something slightly different. So I wanted to show you just a quick example of this, which is, um, this is one that we actually did at a, a company I worked for before. We had developer evenings, and um, we did something that at the time was frankly terrifying. We, um, we got the laptop, hooked it up to the projector like this, put it at the front, and um, we had two people sit down, pair programming, and we went through this exercise so that you would sit down and you would, the first person would write the first test, did it failing, the next person would write the next bit of code. Once they got the test passing, then that person would stand up, shuffle along, the next person would come in. So we just went around the entire development team doing this, just cycling everybody in and out. Um, once you get to the later stages in this and someone decides that you know, bringing in a regular expression would be a good solution, everybody's had maybe a couple beers, the shouting starts, but it was a really excellent way to get everybody comfortable with just going up there and doing some code in front of your peers and knowing that there were going to be problems and not really being that worried about it. So again, this is something that you can play with. It's a very simple, a very simple problem, just going through, but this gets you into the mindset of doing TDD properly, by how do I take a problem and break it down into simple steps that I can just solve piece by piece. Some other things I wanted to show you with this. Um, this was something that I set up, so if you're using Linux as your development environment, then um, you can just set up a little loop there. This uses the iNotify library, which watches for file system changes. So all of that, all that does is whenever you save a file, it will rerun the unit tests. So you can stick that running in one window. You can have your code running in another window, and you get that really nice immediate feedback. As soon as you save it and you've got it right, tests go green over here. So you get a really nice kind of instant gratification feedback cycle. OK. Ready? Yoda, yeah. Oh, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Okay. No, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, we're gonna go with Yoda, though, in this one. So, so Yoda is, of course, a Jedi master. Now, what does it mean to to master your craft? This is the uh, the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition. Um, so this is a really useful way of understanding your skill level in a particular area and also understanding how that mean, how you fit in with the rest of the team and how you interact with people who are at other skill levels. So novice means that you have um, heard about a subject. Maybe you've attended a talk, conference talk. Maybe you've read a blog entry, that kind of thing. Beginner means that you have maybe run through a tutorial. Um, you're aware of the technology, you're able to you know, follow instructions to, to create that solution, um, but you have to refer back to the documentation each time, and you don't really understand why you're doing these things, but you're, just, you're able to follow the instructions to make them happen. Now, competent. Competent is a good place to be. Competent is where most of us sit for the majority of the skills that we use in our day-to-day -day job. Competent means, as it kind of implies, that you're able to do this stuff fairly naturally. You're not just reading instructions and following them. You're able to reason a bit about why you're following them. Um, and you, you understand some of the stuff that's going on in the background. Proficient. Proficient is kind of where you want to aim 
at being. So proficient is, again, you're that step further where you now know where it's appropriate to take shortcuts, you understand the justifications for the things that you're doing deeply, and you know when is the right time to apply this particular thing. And what's more important, if you're proficient, you're really good at helping other people move through the novice and beginner up to the competent stage. Expert. Expert is a slightly tricky one. So expert means that you're kind of into the, the wizard level um, tier of, of expertise in a particular area. So the problem with experts is that because this kind of stuff is such inherent reflexive knowledge to them, often when you look at something that an expert does, you know, for example, um, you need to write a search engine and they do it in a single line of Perl. And <laughs> no, one, no one can work out how this works but it's faster than anything else that you've written. Um, it's just, you know, it's horrendously ugly. The problem, so experts are really good for getting things done, but the problem is experts are really bad at teaching novices and beginners because they just jump them straight to the shortcut. Um, and it means that you get into that kind of cargo cult mentality where you have novices and beginners copying these very complex solutions and just kind of blanket applying them in situations where they don't understand why they should be doing it. Um, also, expert. When we did this internally and we're ranking the development team, expert is kind of, not everybody has an expert level rating. Um, for example, I used to work with uh, Constantine, who was the author of BHAT, and um, so he was the only person who had an expert level rating in BHAT in the company because he wrote the tool. There are other ways of looking at this as well. I'll put these slides up later, so all the links in here, I, you obviously cannot read this, but it's clickable if you want to follow it later. Um, this is a similar kind of thing. So this takes you through the kind of stages of skill acquisition as a software developer. So it's a very similar kind of process here, except they've, they've expanded it out a little bit. And what I really wanted to cover in this bit is it's about productivity. So before I go on to the next slide is is there anyone who is like a, a hardcore scientist or engineer or mathematician in here? No? Good. Okay. So I can call this a graph and <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to throw anything at me. Right? So, so what we have over here is those seven stages of skill acquisition along the bottom and we have productivity up that axis which is measured in uh, cups of coffee or something. And now what it's showing is that at the early stages here, your productivity is low, but you're still getting stuff done. Once you move just past that initial area of knowledge, that's when you kind of, your productivity actually initially drops. Because that's when you get into the area where suddenly you're aware of just how ignorant you are about all of these things. And rather than just getting some code that works, you start looking at your code and start going, oh, no, no, this is not, I can't, I can't push this. This is, <laughs> I'm going to get fired. Um, so there's this little dip here where you become aware of just how much you don't know and then it starts ramping up. Then you get here and this is what they term the researcher phase. So this again kind of ties in with the expert phase. Um, research is where if you are a uh, consultant um, or similar, then you want people who are around this stage. People who are very good at using tools to solve problems and get solutions out there. Once you move into the researcher stage, people stop being that interested in actually solving the problem at hand and just going through the same motions again. They want to be the ones building the new tools, exploring new areas, trying out prototypes. So again, it's a case of finding out where your skills lie and what level you're at and what level your team is at and making sure that you're able to pair people up in the right places and make sure that you're able to understand what your skill level is and how you apply that in different situations. Okay. Now we talked about, oh, yeah, I, I can call that a graph. That had no measurements on it. That just had some numbers on axes. But we are engineers. So if we're going to do this stuff, if we're going to improve, then we need to make sure that we are measuring things. Um, so who, who has like a, a CI server? Yeah, so you guys, like, you measure, like, code coverage, yeah? Any other metrics people, people measure? 
electromagnetic complexity, yeah, yeah, okay. So the point is, especially with a, like a lot of tools, because there's like a whole bunch of reporting that does just configure it out of the box, uh, you get a lot of measurements back. The problem is, you need to make sure that you are measuring the correct thing. Um, because, because you need to measure systems, be very careful when you're measuring people. Um, because whenever you start applying a measurement to a person, um, they start thinking about what that measurement means and they change their behavior because they know they're under observation. Um, so two of the stories that I wanted to share in this bit. Um, I was talking to uh, Kevlin Henney before and he was explaining how he had gone into a company um, to help them out with some legacy code uh, and some testing related things and they had a build server where they measured code coverage and we want code coverage to be high. So they had linked developer bonuses to code coverage, which on the face of it doesn't seem so bad, okay? Keep code coverage high, you get a bonus. The problem was that this started encouraging behavior on the legacy code base where if the code had coverage, right? It doesn't matter if it was a good test, it doesn't matter if it wasn't actually testing anything at all. If it had coverage, then people would shy away from touching that code. Because if they had to do more work to rewrite the test, then their bonus became in danger. If there were particularly hairy areas of the code, like the crafty legacy stuff where the guy who wrote it has disappeared, um, then again, they started staying away from those areas of the code. So the net result was that rather than getting code coverage to increase, People got afraid of touching code because writing tests for those areas was hard. Uh, and it actually ended up damaging their code coverage because no one would touch the hard stuff and no one would go back and take care of the tests that were bad. Um, so then the other story about measuring people is, um, is to use a technique called stack ranking. So who, who's heard of stack ranking? Uh, okay, so this, this is kind of like... Um, I, this, this was kind of popular in tech companies. So the idea of stack ranking is, again, it's a very developer-oriented thing to do. You get everybody, and you rank them based on their performance. So if you've got 10 employees, you've just got a list, top to bottom, best to worst. Now, the harsh version of stack ranking says, well, what you do is you, you rank all of your people like that in a stack, uh, and then you just fire the bottom 30%. Because, you know, you've, you've instantly just improved your workforce massively. And, and again, uh, if you are able to just refer to people as resources, then this kind of thing sounds like it might make sense, right? I mean, it's harsh, but you're getting rid of the bottom 30%, so stuff should improve. The problem this led to uh, in a particular company is that they did this stack ranking. Um, people realized that what they needed to do was not be good at their job, they just needed to be better than the person next to them. And what this led to was things where someone would need help on a project, um, or someone knew something valuable that you know, would help another project, they would deliberately withhold that information. Keep information to themselves so that they could profit from it. Because otherwise, especially like if that team was doing quite well, you're kind of like, you guys are already ahead. If we help you more, then you know, we've got no chance of beating you in the stack ranking. Um, so this is the thing. That measurement as an objective level thing is fine. But as soon as you start applying it to people, then they recognize that they're being measured. So it's the, it's the same sort of story about you know, you're out in the woods with a friend, and uh, suddenly you see a bear, and the bear is sort of eyeing you guys up kind of hungrily. Um, so your friend is like, you know, we we should run, we should run right now. And you're kind of, you're just calmly there lacing your shoes up, um, do a couple stretches, and then you just kick your friend in the leg really hard. And, <laughs> and they're kind of like, what, what are you doing? We need to, we both need to run away. We need to run away from this bear. And you're like, no, 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 we don't need to run away from the bear. All I need to do is run faster than you. So, so when you are measuring things, you need to choose a metric Okay, and the metric needs to help you achieve a goal. 
Once you've achieved that goal, you need to review the metric again to decide whether it's actually helping you achieve your cause. So if your goal is we need, we need a functioning unit test suite across this module of code, then use code coverage. Once you reach the code coverage goal, like if you're doing TDD properly, then your code is covered. So code coverage is kind of a meaningless metric. It just becomes a binary for you. So you can stop measuring it. Um, yes. So these are legs from Shell, who's a character in Portal. Um, oh yeah, we're covering games as well. Right. Someone was playing Minecraft in one of the previous talks. Uh, so, so if you've got Steam, um, or if they've got Steam, maybe you know, ask them if they can download Portal and, uh, and have a go on that. Um, but basically, Portal is from a company called Valve. Um, now, Valve um, leaked their employee handbook, um, or had it leaked by someone. Now, one of my fallback plans for this talk is you know, if it was going really badly, then I was just going to link to this, and we were just going to sit down and read the handbook together. Because the entirety of the handbook, I'm not a massive Valve fanboy. Yes, I am. I am a massive Valve <laughs> fanboy. <laughs> but so th this handbook is amazing. It's like this entirely hand-drawn little novel about you know, how things work at Valve and you joining as a new employee. So one of the things that they cover in there, I, honestly, we I could just put the PDF up, and we could just go through it, and, and it would be fine. But this is one of the things they talk about um, as, as how you should try and develop as an employee. And they refer to it as T-shaped people. So the idea that you have this very broad, shallow range of skills, but you choose a couple areas where you have deep expertise on them. So for me, uh, this, this definitely came about when um, I had a, a small project come in, and uh, we didn't have a project manager available for that project. And uh, my, my manager came to me, and he's like, project's pretty simple. Um, we're thinking, do you want to try doing the project management on this one? And I was thinking to myself, I can use spreadsheets, so I'm pretty sure I can do the project management. Um, how are we doing for time? Half an hour. Oh, awesome. OK, good. I can keep rambling a bit more then. I, I, I sometimes. I, sometimes get a bit worried that I do these talks more for my benefit, because I, I just like telling these stories, and I, I lose track of the time a bit. Um, but anyway, so I go into this project, and I'm thinking, OK, I'm going to have to get myself a copy of Excel, because OpenOffice is clearly not doing the job for, for all of the spreadsheets that we use by default. So I went in, and not only did I think that I could take care of the project management, but I thought I would have time to do some coding as well. Uh, as, as you can imagine, this went tragically wrong and took what should have been a simple project and turned it into a complete disaster. Um, but the upshot of this was that I realized that by broadening my skills and trying out a bit of project management, where I thought project management was really simple, turns out I had just been working with really good project managers who had made it look simple. So even if they're skills that you're not going to use, you know, branch out a bit. Talk to your QA people. Talk to your finance people. Find out some things about their job, because it's going to give you a better appreciation for how the company works as a whole. And it's going to let you do your job better, because you know the information and the way that you need to interact with them to feed them what they need. OK. I said there was going to be Quake 3 source code. So that's what we come to now. Um, so the idea here is that. If you come to one of these conferences and you feel like you haven't learned anything at the end of it and that you're a much better developer than everyone else here, then you've probably been wasting your time. Um, admittedly, we're in Miami, so it's, it's not a total lose situation. Um, but what we can say is someone who might fall into that category would be John Carmack from id Software. So they open sourced the Quake 3 source code. And um, a friend of mine runs a 3D graphics forum. He, he also works for Imagination Technologies, who are the company that make the, the chip inside of the iPhones. And he does, ba basically, his job is doing a, sort of a whole bunch of performance-related stuff on 3D graphics. So he actually understands some of this stuff. Um, so they were looking at the Quake 3 source code. And inside of there, 
there's uh, an algorithm for calculating the inverse square root. And this code, at the time, um, did it about three times faster than the assembly level code that was working. And so this is very impressive. I mean, this is a really good algorithm. And they decided to try and work out where it came from. Because if I show you the algorithm here, and this, so this is direct copy paste from the Quake 3 source code. Now the reason inverse square root is important <laughs> is <laughs> is because it lets you, basically it's, it's used for calculating the normal against a plane. Um, so if you need to do things like uh, reflections or bouncing stuff off other surfaces. So up here, um, how many C programmers have we got in here? Good, you guys can help me through this then. Because <laughs> this. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, okay, so I mean, we can start from the outside, right? It's going to return a floating point. It's called quick, you know, reverse square root. It takes a floating point in, uh, and it's going to return y at the bottom. So we set up some variables, uh, you know, three halves. Then, now this is this is where it gets kind of crazy. I is, what is that? A pointer to a Pointer to a reference? Um, the memory address is y at the long memory address, and the C reference is getting the long value of y. Right. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah, so then we take this, this hex value, and we do a bit y. Oh, no, we subtract this bit y shift of i. and. <laughs> i, i. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so obviously, we're looking at this, and we're kind of like, how, what? I, <laughs> so I, I, I'm reasonably sure on what a, an inverse square root is. This does not look like calculating an inverse square root. And, and clearly, it didn't necessarily look like that to the people who were writing the code. So, so people are going through this on the forum, and... Um, and I finally kind of thought, well, what if we just emailed John Carmack and asked him, you know, what, what were you smoking when you wrote this? <laughs> and um, so my friend emails him and, uh, and just kind of forgets about it and then gets a reply back from, from John Carmack saying, I, you know, I'm, I'm flattered that you think that I wrote this, um, but, but I didn't. Um, it was pretty sure it was, you know, someone else on the team. So he, he gives him this other guy's email address. So my friend emails him uh, and CCs him in, uh, CCs John Carmack in, and the guy's like, "Oh, cool! You know, long time we haven't talked in ages. Oh, this is a bit of a blast from the past." It's like this this code is familiar. I recognize it. Uh, I have written some inverse square root functions before when I was doing some computational fluid dynamics for this guy in Sweden, um, you know, like you do. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but but I didn't write this. So it kind of looks familiar, like some of the stuff you'd see from, like, he mentions these MIT hackmem documents. So he's kind of like, but, but I do know someone who I think is responsible for this. So he, he points him to this other guy who, um, who used to work at 3DFX. So he, so Rish, my friend, then sends him an email. And again, the, the guy, the answer comes back as the kind of, yeah, I I did do some re-implementing of a thing like that, but but again, you know, that's not that's not my code. I mean, it looks familiar. You know, I've seen seen variations of it in a couple of places, but no. So and that's and that's where the trail went cold. So basically, this just appeared out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> this comes so so even yeah, <laughs> even John Carmack is not above just copying and pasting code that works and sticking it in. Did your friend ever check the right? Oh, um, right. So you can follow the link there. He goes into a load more detail. About it also explains what the constant is and what's actually going on inside of here. But, but yeah, so I, I just love that <laughs> there's commented out lines just left in there because it's like, <laughs> Uh, I don't know, good enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can be, it's not. But, yeah. 
Maybe, maybe when they deleted the commented line, it stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, now, now, so the issue is, if working with people like John Carmack, so let's let's take one of his creations, um, let's pop that in. So this isn't John Carmack, but it's it's someone who is uh, associated with John Carmack in some way. Um, so this. This guy, Brian Hook, he, he joined id Software. And he writes in this blog entry about how he joined. And um, he, he joined id with the impression that he was going to shake things up. Because he was kind of like, I am a badass programmer. And I'm going to come in there, and I'm going to show these guys how it is done. Um, and he was overly ambitious, but he rapidly found that he was just nowhere near as smart as the other guys who were in the dev team there. And he was getting into problems where you know, he was like working really late at night to try and meet the, like the, the deadlines. And then he'd be coming in early in the morning. So I've had a couple projects like that where you're just pulling all this overtime, and it's not even really making a difference. He was burning himself out. His performance was just tailing right off. So eventually, he got to this stage where he just said to himself, actually, if I just accept that I'm not as smart as these people, then, and just set myself realistic goals that I can achieve, suddenly he found that he was actually achieving them. He was feeling happy. Everybody else was happy with his work. He was being far more productive. So, so it's a case of there's code out there that even John Carmack doesn't understand and doesn't know where it came from. And so you can feel OK if you are just getting some code into your project where you're just kind of like, I don't know why this works, but it works. OK. Let's talk about um, attitude, then. So, anyone recognize that? Yes, awesome. Okay, so Jeffrey Lebowski from The Big Lebowski. Um, the dude abides. Now this is, I, I feel like this is a good attitude to take to life, you know, in, in professional life as well. Um, especially if it involves white Russians. That's, that's <laughs> fine with me. Now, the problem is being, being passionate and authoritative on a subject is not necessarily the same thing as being an angry asshole. Now, I want to talk a little bit about a slightly different attitude. Um, so, so these are some excerpts from a mailing list on a relatively popular open source project. This is all from the one message. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's try and something this issue. Right. Ouch. Oh. Well, at least he self censored that one so that you know no one's gonna get offended. <laughs> so so this is, this is Linus when, um, when basically a guy had um, merged some stuff that uh, Linus had a couple disagreements with. Uh, <laughs> nothing, nothing major. Um, now, now the thing is, it's kind of, this is, this is funny when it's like Linus going off at NVIDIA because NVIDIA is a big faceless corporation with no real people inside of it at all. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, you know, you're not hurting anyone's feelings by doing that. But this is kind of like, I don't know, maybe these two guys are totally fine with this. But it's, it's kind of, this is on a public, you know, mailing list. And you don't, you don't have any context. All you have is this. This might be the only thing that you know about it because you found this message because everybody linked to it off of Twitter at the time. Um, and the thing is, that's, that's out there, that's public, and that's going to last forever. And the, the issue with this is kind of like, if I, you know, I've submitted code for review before uh, at work. And sometimes, you know, I, I've been, you know, taking some shortcuts because I needed to get something particular done. And I accept that, you know, I create some bad code. If someone came back to me with feedback like this, um, it would not encourage me to fix my code. I think it would encourage me to, to maybe, like, I don't know, subtly 
pee in their coffee when they weren't looking at something <laughs> like that. So, so the issue here, and um, I, I don't think that's necessarily a positive attitude, and, um, and the, the effect that this has. And um, what I'm actually going to do here is quote something from Elizabeth's blog. So Elizabeth wrote this blog post um, about, about feeling uncomfortable within certain communities. And, and she compared it to this. This is what I really like. So it's about this grocery store near your house um, where it's kind of like dark and dingy. And, and what I love is that she's kind of saying it doesn't particularly make her like personally angry or personally offended, um, but she, just, she doesn't want to go there. There's, like, there's nothing appealing about it. So for me, that, that Linus rant there is the kind of, I read stuff like that and it's kind of like, wow, I'm not sure I would ever feel capable of contributing to the kernel because it's kind of like, that's clearly not going to be a good environment for me to just kind of experiment and learn a bit. I mean, if I s submit something and it's kind of like, hey, this is my first time and then someone just tears me a new one because, you know, I was using tabs instead of spaces or something. Um, <laughs> and, and yet we use spaces, which is clearly wrong. We should be using tabs, but, you know, we, <laughs> we roll with it because it's just easier now that we've got one standard. Now, now the point is that if you are, if you are creating an open source project, um, or if you are doing some kind of community thing, then this, that's not a good way to get other people involved. And the, pro the problem that you are going to run into, if that's you, um, you know, on, on open source code or at work, is that there are contributions that you might have received that are just never going to happen because the person just decided that you weren't worth talking to, that it wasn't worth risking having such an appalling experience um, just so that they could submit a pull request or something. Okay, but the thing I, I kind of wanted to say is that, and I throw a beard in here, so uh, despite over a decade of Linux use, uh, I am not able to grow a beard. Uh, I, I, can, <laughs> <laughs> I can kind of grow a neck beard, um, but that is not, that's not a good look. Um, is so, that the one with the particular beard that you have here? Yes, yeah, so. Ronnie, you No, 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 no. It's, um, no, it's, it, it's, no, no. No, it's, it's not, it's not a tech, it's not a tech person. It's not, it's not 300. Go back, okay, wait, I'll give you a. <laughs> 200. <laughs> so. So the point that I'm trying to make with this beard is that um, by being this rational and accepting person, it doesn't mean that you are a kind of meek pushover who never gets angry about stuff, who just lets everything slide, who doesn't stand up for the things that they believe in. Um, so this beard is, is actually from Brian Blessed. Okay, now... Wait a minute, we, we aren't in England, so do you, you guys know who Brian Blessed is? Right. Uh, okay, uh, so what, what would you have actually seen him in? I, Flash Gordon, yeah, right, the, the guy who's the, um, the what? what is it? Voltan, yeah, like the big angel guy with the beard who shouts a lot. So the issue with Brian Blessed is that there is no chance that you would ever not hear Brian Blessed if he was speaking about something. But, but on the flip side, I can never imagine anyone being offended by Brian Blessed. Maybe slightly scared just because of the volume, um, but he, he is not an offensive person. So it's kind of, it is perfectly okay to disagree with someone, to tell them what, the, what they have done is wrong. You can just, you can do it without necessarily coming out like Linus does. Um, that said, I, I haven't written a major open source operating system, so maybe that is the right way to, to do things and make it work. Um, so some of the things I wanted to cover about this is attack ideas, not people. So it's, it's totally okay to criticize someone's code,
but you don't need to personally criticize them for uh, social failings or something. Um, when you have bad news, make sure you deliver that bad news as soon as you know about it. This is especially important. Is anyone responsible for managing people? Okay, so you, you guys have probably seen this. Like I had, um, I had, uh, I had a guy who had started, and he was on his probation, uh, and that lasts for like three months, and then you you know you pass your probation at the end, and you know you're you're then a, a proper full time employee, and um, you, we do a little probation review meeting at the end where we just kind of go through performance, and then it's like hooray, here's your letter, you're now officially an employee. Um, and when we sat down, he's kind of like, so, you know, I just wanted to, to check, you know, is there, is there going to be any bad news? And it's kind of like, I would be a really shitty manager if I had just been sat here for three months cataloging every bad thing you did just so I could save it up for the end so that we could have this meeting. And I'd be kind of like, no, 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 <laughs> that sucked, get out. <laughs> so, no, that's the case of when someone does something wrong, you tell them right away. It's like ripping a Band-Aid off. You know, you just, you need to make it, you need to make it happen because the quicker you do it, the less it's going to hurt. The longer you leave bad news, then people are not only going to get angry about giving that sort of bad feedback, they're also going to get angry about the fact that you sat on it for so long because either you were, you didn't want to have that confrontation with them or because you just thought it would be amusing to save everything up and then have a massive rant at them in one go. Um, this one, learn to say no as well. So again, this is like if someone's asking you to do overtime um, or you know, understanding is this overtime important right now? Is it actually going to help the project? Or are we just doing it because you think that throwing overtime at the project will get it back on track? Um, if anyone knows how to do this effectively, then come and find me later and let me know because... <laughs> I, I am constantly trying to like self-improve on this one, but you still end up taking on loads of extra stuff and over-committing to things. I, I'm flying back on Sunday, and then I'm flying back out to New York, and then I fly back from New York to London, and I land, and I'm giving a conference talk like at 12 o'clock, and my flight sort of lands at 7. So it's kind of... You, you get one of those things where it's like, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this talk, and then I'm just going to walk out of the room and pass out on the floor for a little while. <laughs> um, ah, yeah, another thing we had at a company I used to work for as well is um, whenever we had a new project kicking off, um, we had a section at the end of the kind of initial project meeting um, where we, we asked for DFQs. Um, so DFQ stands for Dumb Fucking Question. And... And what this was, this was, this was an open forum for you to ask anything you wanted about the project. Even if you had been sat there playing Flappy Bird throughout the entire meeting and hadn't listened to anything that was being said, it was totally okay for you to ask questions that made that completely obvious. Okay? Because the idea was that, um, that by asking those questions there and then, no matter how dumb they might have seemed, like, if you didn't understand something, it was much better to get that sorted out right there and then rather than waiting, you know, three months into the project where at that point it becomes clear that, you know, you have a fundal, fundamental misunderstanding about why we're trying to do a particular thing. So over time, like, the cost, the cost of those questions really goes up if you just let them sit. So, you know, create a space where it's okay to, to ask really stupid questions. One of my colleagues at the time would always say, there are no stupid questions, only stupid people. Uh, wasn't, he wasn't a people person. No. <laughs> okay. Now, I did say that you, um, you shouldn't be a hero, but I'm going to make a little exception to that. This projector's pretty bad, but... Yeah? Iron Man? Okay. More specifically, which film? <laughs> oh, did someone say okay, it's... So this is Iron Man from The Avengers. Now, the reason that this is relevant is... <laughs> 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 
Bear with me on this. <laughs> okay. The reason this is relevant is that, I mean, Tony Stark falls into the category of being the kind of the standalone genius who won't work with anyone, who can't work with anyone. But part of his character arc inside the Avengers film is that he learns to work with the other members of the team and becomes a marginally more well-rounded human being. So the idea here is that you can actually be a hero. You can go out there, but you need to do it as part of the community. So there are loads of ways that you can get involved with the community as well. It's not just about writing code, although that's an important part of it. But basically, there's conferences, writing blogs, buying people pizza and beer. Um, I'm going to diverge for a minute. So on the pizza and beer one, this is like a good one. Like if, you're, if you have legal expertise, helping people with licensing their projects as well, like making sure people have the right license files and open source. Um, when I was doing some of my engineering training here, we were talking about open source projects that we can use uh, and contributing back to open source projects. And they were telling us a story about how um, one of the projects we wanted to use, the guy had a pizza license associated with it. So his license was basically, you can use my software, um, but for every you know, server that you install it on, just you know, buy me a slice of pizza. Um, so we wanted to use it, and uh, we, we had to like, send a mail kind of going, uh, look, this is more of a logistics issue because <laughs> there's literally not enough pizza in the world to, to send you a slice for every machine we're going to install it on. <laughs> <laughs> so... So in that case, we actually, we, he re-licensed, he did a separate license so that we could license it just on a, on a slightly more sane arrangement. <laughs> uh, I'm not quite sure what we did. Maybe just like send him one pizza for life or something for the, re for the rest of his life. Um, but all kinds of stuff that you can help doing. You, know, you, can, you can give money in terms of sponsor sponsorship. One of the things that is really useful in the PHP community is when there's a release candidate out, for the next version of PHP, just grab it and build it on your machine. Okay, you don't, you don't need any tech, technical expertise on this. You literally just need to download it and follow the instructions because the entire point is they don't have enough machines to build this on every single possible con um, configuration, but you are the people who are going to be using it. So if you build it on your machine and it comes up with a problem, then you've helped make PHP better right there. So there's, there's just... All of this stuff, there's like no excuse to not be involved in the community in some way. Um, like speaking at conferences, did you know that for basically one hour of work, someone will fly you around the world and put you up in a hotel in Miami? <laughs> <laughs> so I would, I would recommend conference speaking. That's, that is one way to contribute. Okay, and write code. That, that's always a good one. So finally, you should enjoy what you're doing. You recognize? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So, so really, and I mean, given the what day? Saturday, isn't it? Yeah. So you guys are all here on a Saturday. Okay. So I assume that's because you probably have some kind of love for what it is you're doing. Um, I always kind of think that, that I'm, I'm quite lucky that someone wants to pay me to write code. I mean, I, I, had, a, I had an experience where it, I'd gone through the entire year and my manager was bugging me because as per usual, I'd kind of forgotten to take any holiday. Um, so I ended up just kind of like booking most of December off, not to really do anything, just to sit at home. So, so after five days of just sitting around in my underwear playing Skyrim, um, I, got, I got to the stage where I just picked up my laptop again and started writing code for, for my own project. And it was kind of like, I actually can't stop doing this. This is like, a, it's like a disease rather than a, a profession. But luckily, luckily someone wants to give me money to do it. So the idea is that, you know, whatever you pick as a profession, if you're going to invest your own time in it, then make sure that it's something that you enjoy doing as well. So I think we've now built a much better developer than we started with. Um, could it be you? 
you want it to be you? We can, uh, Elizabeth had a saw in her previous presentation, so if you want to try this a bit later, we can start taking some limbs off and seeing if we can reattach <laughs> some different things. Um, so with that, I just wanted to say thank you very much for uh, listening to me ramble through all of this. Um, joined in there. If you want to give me some feedback on this talk, that would be awesome.